Uh, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Welcome again um, to the E.M. Ramsey Center seminars. Uh, today we have a great honor to have the Emeritus Andreas Sidrios Professor of Science and Religion, John Brook, with us, former president of the International Society for Science and Religion, and uh, credited for offering to the academic environment the thesis of the complexity of the re relationships between science and religion. So it's for us a fantastic opportunity to hear him speak. Um, and today he will be speaking about science and secularization, where the myths may I really lie. <laughs> <laughs> and um, which is a research topic he's been working on for the last few years, and uh, I'm sure it will be a fantastic discussion afterwards. So please welcome John Brook. Thank you, Ignacio. It's always a very great pleasure to have an excuse to be back here in Oxford and to see a few friends from times past, that adds to the joy. If you're very astute and you've really looked at this title, you'll see that it is ambiguous, <laughs> and of course deliberately so, um, to ask where myths lie might be a question about their identification. Where are they found and in what do they consist? Or the question might be about truth and accuracy. In what respect do the myths we identify convey falsehoods? How do they tell lies? Now in these informal reflections on science and secularization, I want to try to keep both those variants of the question in view. Myths about the relations between science and religion are not difficult to find. Some of you, many of you perhaps, know a wonderful little book edited by my friend Ron Numbers, the title of which is Galileo Goes to Jail and Other Myths About Science and Religion. Now there are 25 other myths, or rather 24 <laughs> other myths in that book. I know that because I wrote myth number 25, or rather <laughs> shot it down, which incidentally was on secularization. And I will draw to some extent and rather shamelessly uh, on that little essay tonight. But having mentioned the Galileo case, let me just show you the, tr the entrenchedness of that myth. A few years ago, I was giving a lecture at Queen's Belfast and the BBC wanted to interview me. It was at the height of the Troubles, and I said that I was very happy to be interviewed as long as I was not asked overtly political questions, because I didn't think that was my forte. Um, so they agreed to that, and I happily went into the studio, and the first question I was asked was, did I think Protestants or Catholics had made the greater contribution to science. <laughs> but I tell this story, I tell this story because here's the myth. The man in the studio interviewing me began the interview by saying, now we all know, we all know that Galileo was put to death for believing that the earth was round. <laughs> if you don't know what's wrong with that, see me afterwards. <laughs> I suppose we better just have a picture of the old man um, so we know who we're talking about now. Anyway, let's begin by looking to the future rather than the past. Here's a prediction about the future made by the anthropologist Anthony Wallace in 1966. And he wrote this, belief in supernatural powers is doomed to die out all over the world as a result of the increasing adequacy and diffusion of scientific knowledge. Embedded in that rather ill-fated prediction as it happens 
was the assumption that science is a primary agent of secularization. And so I suppose the first question is whether that could itself be a myth. I do believe it to be so, and much of what I want to say this evening will revolve around that particular issue. But let's begin with a more recent event than 1966. 40 years later, in 2006, a new Centre for Inquiry held an inaugural meeting in Washington, D.C. And its aim, explicitly, I quote, was to promote and defend reason, science and freedom of inquiry in all areas of human endeavour. And that was deemed necessary because, and I quote again, because of the resurgence of fundamentalist religions across the nation and their alliance with political ideological movements to block science. So Wallace's prediction of 1966 by 2006 looks to be in pretty serious trouble. Prominent scientists signed a declaration lamenting, and I quote again, the persistence of paranormal and occult beliefs and a retreat into mysticism. Persistence not doomed to die out, it would seem. Now their contention, that rather eminent scientific group, was that public policies should be shaped by secular values and that science and secularism, now here's the next possible myth, that science and secularism are inextricably linked, in inverted commas, quote again. Now, if they are, if they are, and if Richard Dawkins is right to regard the existence of God as a vulnerable scientific hypothesis, which is what he allows and thinks is the case, it seems reasonable to assert that scientific progress has indeed been a principal cause of secularization. Yet, as the sociologist of religion, David Martin, pointed out, this claim belongs to a category of obviously true propositions, which, however, on closer examination, turn out to be largely false. As with many myths, the proposition that science causes secularization does contain elements of truth, and it would be silly to pretend otherwise. Definitions of secularization usually refer to at least two different processes. The displacement of religious authority and control by civic powers, and secondly, the loss of beliefs characteristic of religious traditions. Now, if we really went into this in depth, we would realise that those two processes don't always coincide, and there's no logical necessity as to why they would. But if scientific knowledge has had a corrosive effect, lending support to worldviews less dominated by the supernatural, then we can at least see why correlations are made between scientific progress and secularization. <coughs> Whoops. If, as Thomas Hobbes argued in the 17th century, the origins of religious belief lay in the fear and incomprehensibility of nature's forces, then, as knowledge replaced ignorance, superstition would surely wane. And where scientific explanation remained incomplete, religious thinkers might plug the gaps with their gods, but further scientific advance would again reduce their influence. This is a fairly routine kind of secularist argument. We also know that the content of scientific theories 
has sometimes clashed with conventional readings of sacred texts. And this was true of the Earth's motion in Galileo's day. And it's no myth, of course, that he was placed on trial in 1633, even if the issue was not that the Earth is round. We also know, of course, that the evolutionary accounts of human origins in Darwin's day were a source of perplexity and sometimes vexation. I can never resist the opportunity of throwing, <laughs> throwing in soapy Sam Wilberforce, Bishop of Oxford, of course, who here in this university in 1860 made a fool of himself, or so it's often suggested, uh, when he tried to bait Thomas Henry Huxley by asking whether he preferred to think of his uh, ancestor on his grandmother's side or grandfather's side um, being an ape. And you all know Huxley is supposed to have won that encounter by rubbing his hands with glee and saying, ah, the Lord hath delivered him into mine hands that he would, he would rather, says Huxley, have an ape for an ancestor than a bishop. Or... <laughs> than a bishop of that kind who used his dignity and authority to pontificate on matters he knew nothing about. Now, that story I've just uh, recounted, you all probably heard it, that in itself is a myth in many, many ways. Um, even Huxley's son, who wrote The Life and Letters, Leonard Huxley, said it would be absurd to suppose that Huxley won that debate. Contemporaries there even suggest that Huxley couldn't even carry his voice to the back of the room. And if you've been in the room uh, in the Natural History Museum where that debate took place, you'll realise to project your voice to the back would be quite an achievement. It was other people tried to persuade Dave, uh, tried to persuade Darwin himself that it was they, not Wilberforce, um, or rather they, not Huxley, who had bashed the bishop. A um, number of scientists present were wanting to claim Darwin's approval of what they had done. But as Leonard Huxley pointed out, the majority of people in that audience would have been on the bishop's side. And even though it was a silly jibe to throw out, um, it doesn't appear that that debate had any long-term consequences for the relationship between science and religion, despite what you hear about that having been the great debate, which is how I find it described in America. Um, nevertheless, are these not instances of science providing resources for secularization. And I think one often sees connections made of this kind. Um, one of my good friends and colleagues who's an expert on the cultural life of, of India wrote only a few years ago, the introduction of Western education, philosophy, and technology in 19th century India had consequences where we had a massive and thoroughgoing secularization. So Western science and philosophy and technology and out comes secularization. And if one needed further evidence of this kind, perhaps from other cultural traditions, Judaism perhaps, many of the most eminent scientists of the 20th century were non-Jewish Jews, if you see my meaning. There is, however, a question whether these elements of truth constitute the whole truth or whether the formula that science causes secularization has escaped criticism, partly because of its usefulness in promoting science and suppressing religion. It's a popular thesis because it does have that effect. The science causes secularization formula, I think, is seriously misleading. Are these two processes really linked inextricably? To go back to that adverb I highlighted earlier. 
historical evidence, I think, suggests that inextricability is too strong an assertion. It's commonly assumed, I think, by natural scientists, many of whom rejoice in what they see as the corrosive effects on religion of rigorous empirical methods. But by contrast, many social scientists now reject what was once known as the secularization thesis, that an inexorable loss of religious authority and function is simply irreversible in societies permeated <coughs> by science and technology. That's the claim that is now rejected. And paradoxically, if you think about it, the urgency of that plea from the center of inquiry in Washington is more supportive of the view found among the social scientists that religious beliefs and practices may even regain allegiance in scientifically and technologically advanced societies. If you think about it, it is pretty obvious that in controlling natural forces, science-based technologies have certainly far surpassed the results of contemplation or prayer and supplication. But the effects of science-based technologies on religious practice have been strangely diverse and often unpredictable. Indirectly, I think new scientific technolo technologies have, by facilitating new modes of transport and recreation, have contributed seductive alternatives to the religious life. Indirectly, technologies can have that effect. But, New technologies can also facilitate religious observance. I still remember the first time my wife and I went to Jerusalem. We were staying in a hotel and we were right by the elevator shaft. And for two nights, we had a relatively peaceful time because the elevator wasn't much used and it came up quickly and went down again. However, we were kept awake um, throughout one night because the elevator suddenly started stopping on every floor. The doors opened and shut and it then went up another floor. And you may be beginning to see what was happening here. For Shabbat, the elevator was pre-programmed to stop on every floor so that anybody inside did not need to push a button. <laughs> they were not working on the Sabbath. Pre-programmed ovens can work that way. And what about PowerPoint? Um, I have seen the attractiveness of religious worship in huge evangelical chapels in the United States, greatly enhanced by PowerPoint presentation where you get the hymns, you get everything up on a huge screen and things are whizzing about uh, in ways that I can't possibly <laughs> emulate um, this evening. But the point is, technology in its implications isn't just a one-way street. It's not just one-way traffic. And it's true of science, I think, even if we can talk about pure science. Okay. So I believe it, that it may be helpful to distinguish between two things. The secularization of science, which has certainly happened in Western cultures. You don't find, find God in scientific textbooks. The secularization of science. But that is not the same thing as secularization by science. But those two are often conflated. Religious language had largely disappeared from technological or rather technical science by the end of the 19th century. But it doesn't mean that religious beliefs were no longer to be found among scientists. Just 
in the last couple of weeks, I've come across a, a rather interesting example. You might find it rather boring because it's about organic chemistry, um, which isn't everybody's favorite science. <laughs> but let me just introduce you for a second to Hermann Kolbe, great German organic chemist of the 19th century, first to synthesize acetic acid artificially, did important work on the hydrocarbons, and particularly um, the radicals methyl and ethyl, which some of you might distantly remember <laughs> <laughs> from O-level chemistry or something of that nature. The reason I found Kolbe interesting in what I was reading was that he had initially been a Lutheran following the convictions of his father, who'd been a pastor in the Lutheran church. He shifted allegiance slightly when he got married to the, um, a more overtly reformed theology. But what we know is that he never lost his faith, as far as one can ever judge, of course. Uh, to the end of his life, he was arguing that a religious faith was underpinned both by the authority of scripture and by a natural theology which he believed chemistry could contribute to, could support. Now, I found it interesting in this respect that Kolbe's Christianity was actually influencing the kind of science, the kind of chemistry, in fact, that he was willing to countenance. And the reason is that a contemporary in Germany, August Kekulé, you might even just see the allusion there to that famous dream that Kekulé is supposed to have had as an inspiration for the cyclic formula of, of benzene. Now, notice in giving benzene that relatively modern formula, we've inserted some bonds. For Kolbe, to presume to know anything about how atoms were arranged in space or how they were bonded together for Kolbe, that is sheer flight of fancy. It is a dream, genuinely a dream. We can never know, says Kolbe, the ultimate arrangement of atoms in a molecule. Well, posterity has not been on his side. But at the time he made that critique, it was clearly reinforced by his religious beliefs because he said, we must not picture atoms in space just as we have been told in our Christian theology not to depict God. So he's making a direct kind of analogy there, which for him has epistemological implications. And what ensued was an extremely interesting philosophical debate about the ontological status of chemical formulae. Do they represent anything? Do they represent anything? Or are they merely convenient devices for predicting uh, the particular course of a chemical reaction in some kind of shorthand way. So, the relationship there between science, chemistry in this case, and Christian theology is much more complicated. There is a real sense in which the chemistry is being influenced by the theology, not the chemistry <coughs> destroying the theology. Scientists with religious convictions have often found confirmation of their faith in the beauty and elegance of the mechanisms that their research uncovers. Now, here's a famous name, um, Johannes Kepler from the early 17th century, one of the great astronomers, of course, um, discovered what we now call the three planetary laws, the laws of planetary motion. Actually, he discovered many more than three, and most of them, sadly, are nonsense. But we tend to remember the three that were right. Um, but the, he did have a real sense, I think, with the articulation, particularly of what we know as the third law, that he discovered something remarkable about creation, which was that there was a real 
mathematical harmony inscribed in the structure of the universe. And he once wrote this after formulating that particular correlation. He says, I'm carried away by unutterable rapture at the divine spectacle of heavenly harmony. The science and the theology are themselves very much in harmony there, and Kepler is seeing his work in astronomy as a confirmation of that biblical image of a world that has been created according to number, weight, and measure. Now, science can corroborate a religious presupposition. It doesn't always chip away at the plausibility. A contemporary example, an example from today, would be the former director of the Human Genome Project, Francis Collins, who sees his work as the unravelling of a God-given code. Now, there's nothing in genetics, as far as Collins is concerned, that need necessarily undermine or corrode a religious conviction. So I much prefer to say that instead of regarding science as the principal agent of secularization, it's actually more accurate to say that scientific theories have been susceptible of both theistic and naturalistic readings. Historically, this is what makes them interesting, they've provided resources for both, for the sacred and for the profane, depending on how they've been interpreted. Sometimes the same concept has been manipulated to generate the sacred and the profane. And I'd just like to give two examples, one from the 17th century, one from the 19th. This is John Tyndall as caricatured there in Vanity Fair, the author of a very famous address in Belfast in 1874, where the British Association for the Advancement of Science was meeting. Tyndall gave a very polemical address. It's become known as the <coughs> Belfast Address because on behalf of the scientific community, he took it upon himself to challenge theology. And those colleges and schools in Ireland, which were simply not taking science seriously enough. And Tyndall, among many of his more aggressive remarks, says, we claim and we shall rest from theology the entire domain of cosmological theory. And as a kind of concomitant to that, he writes a history of science, a triumphalist history, in which science generates properties of matter which displace the spiritual from the world. That means for Tyndall's story, the old atomic theories of antiquity become very important. You remember Leucopis, Democritus, Epicurus were scholars who tried to expel gods from the world by saying we can explain everything simply by talking about nature and nature's causes. Darwin was one of Tyndall's heroes in that address and its very aggressive and polemical tone meant that the reception of Darwin's work in Ireland was very adversely affected because it meant that Darwinism meant materialism and atheism to many who had heard Tyndall's address. Now, the reason I mention this example is just to focus on atomism for a moment because in Tyndall's account, atomism is a vehicle for secularism. It's a vehicle for arguing against, attributing the capacities of matter, as he sees them, to spirit, where they belonged in the past, but from which they should now be stripped. In the 17th century, 
Francis Bacon gave an account of atomism of a very, very different kind. Bacon did not embrace the atomic theory of antiquity. He keeps his distance from it. But he does say that there is no reason on theological grounds why you should not accept it. And then he gives a very good reason, because he actually claims that atomism is more in need of a theistic premise than the cosmology of Aristotle. Aristotle's cosmology does not need a theistic premise. Ignacio will be looking at me in a moment because, of course, Aquinas claimed that it did. Um, but you could well argue that Aristotle's cosmology, as understood by Aristotle, did not need a theistic premise. Um, Bacon says, if you're going to go down an atomic road, you jolly well need a divine marshal. And his essay on atheism put it rather nicely. Even that school which is most accused of atheism doth most demonstrate religion. That is the school of Leucippus and Democritus and Epicurus. For it is a thousand times more credible that four mutable elements and one immutable fifth essence, duly and eternally placed, need no God than that an army of infinite small portions or seeds or atoms unplaced should have produced this order and beauty without a divine marshal. In other words, the very philosophy of nature that is most accused of atheism is the very one that most demonstrates religion. And I like to tell that story because it does, I think, highlight the ambivalence that one might wish to underline when it comes to scientific concepts, which on the metaphysical plane don't actually carry the baggage that proponents of a secular culture often like to imagine. OK, the second example, uh, of course, is the theory of evolution by natural selection. I don't need to tell you who that is. Um, Richard Dawkins, no, it's, that's, no, it's not Richard Dawkins. Um, <laughs> Rich, Richard Dawkins famously says, of course, that um, Darwin first made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. And he does have a point. But it's easy to forget that among Darwin's earliest sympathisers in Britain were Christian clergymen such as Charles Kingsley, uh, who delighted Darwin by suggesting that a god who could make things, make themselves, was actually more admirable than one who simply made things. That from Kingsley was quoted in the second edition of The Origin of Species because Darwin was glad for the clerical support, not the clerical opprobrium in this case. Temple, who welcomed the extension of natural law, did so because he felt it actually gave analogical support for belief in moral law. And Temple was later to become Archbishop of Canterbury putting a kind of Anglican imprimatur on evolutionary theory, which it's never, of course, had or no equivalent in the United States. Although Darwin himself was an agnostic late in life, Darwin denied that he had ever been an atheist. And in The Origin of Species, evolutionary outcomes are described as the result of laws impressed on the world by a creator. So there's nothing even for Darwin in evolutionary theory that detracts from that metaphysical position in which the laws of nature presuppose some kind of transcendent legislation. So instead of seeing science as intrinsically and inextricably secular, <coughs> 
I think it's more correct to see it as neutral with respect to questions concerning God's existence. And interestingly, this is another little surprise one comes across. That's exactly how it was seen by Thomas Henry Huxley. Now, Huxley was anti-clerical, for sure. But that's not the same as being anti-religious. And the two things are, I think, often in need of separation. For Huxley, science is neither Christian nor anti-Christian. It is, in his own words, extra-Christian meaning that it has a scope and autonomy independent of religious interests. Hence, Huxley's insistence, there he is insisting, um, Huxley's insistence that Darwin's theory has no more to do with theism than did the first book of Euclid. Meaning, of course, that it has no bearing on the deeper question whether evolutionary processes themselves might have been seeded in an original design. So there are a lot of myths around about Huxley, but it is interesting that he was so open in that respect. He says there's been far too great a song and dance about the implications of Darwin for design. And would that we hadn't learnt that lesson today. So the pressing question is not whether Darwin's theory has been used to justify unbelief. Of course it has, many times over. But whether its use as a justification conceals other, more important reasons for unbelief. So let's just pause for a moment to remember that the reasons Darwin gave for his unbelief do, I think, dispel the myth that it was his science that did the damage. So here's another myth, that Darwin lost his faith in Christianity when he developed his theory of evolution. Like other Victorian thinkers, Darwin reacted strongly against evangelical Christian preaching on heaven and hell. Members of his own family had been free thinkers. His grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, had been an early advocate of evolution. Darwin's father, the biggest man I ever saw, says Charles, it seems to run in the family if you notice the, uh, the previous shot, um, his father was almost certainly an atheist, and Darwin's brother Erasmus almost certainly so, too. The doctrine that after death, these members of his own family would suffer eternal damnation was, for Charles himself, and I quote, a damnable doctrine. It's the doctrine that ought to be damned, not members of my family. <coughs> He's also, and I think this is interesting, very sensitive to the extent of pain and suffering in the world, which he describes as one of the strongest arguments against belief in a beneficent deity. It's not natural selection per se that's corroding his faith. He's really troubled by that old theological nightmare, how you can rationalise if you think it appropriate to do so, the presence of so much suffering in the world. And each of these concerns for Darwin was crystallised by deaths in his family, that of his father in the late 1840s, and then his 10-year-old daughter Annie early in 1851. Darwin did believe, as I think any of his rational scientist colleagues would have believed. He did believe that as science advances, appeals to miraculous intervention become less plausible and less necessary. But if we're talking about the loss of faith or the loss of belief, I think it has deeper existential roots. <coughs> 
And so the myth in the case of Darwin is that science, more than any other factor, was the agent of his unbelief. And I should just add that one of the things about which Darwin felt very keenly and very deeply was not just the question of human suffering, but the question of animal suffering. Because he acknowledges you can kind of give a rationale for human suffering if you believe, if you believe, that it can inculcate higher moral sensibilities in one way or other. If suffering can be edifying. But you can't say that when you're talking about the animal world. And I think it is very interesting. It is only very recently, in my judgment anyway, that theologians have begun to take a bit more seriously the question of animal suffering. It's one of those themes that has rather been kept under the carpet. I've been talking about these various factors that might encourage secularization as if they can actually be weighed perhaps one against the other. Is that not a misguided enterprise? Well, there have actually been quite impressive surveys done to try to work out what causes a secular thinker to be a secularist. And one of the interesting, the most interesting to a historian anyway, survey of this kind was conducted by Susan Budd, wife of Alan Budd, professor of Queen's, very distinguished um, man, of course. And Susan was a sociologist who examined the period 1850 to 1960, so getting a bit closer to our own time, looking at secularists and the reasons they gave for their conversion from Christianity to unbelief. So she read their autobiographies and she collected an awful lot of correspondence looking for clues as to what had really pushed them away from religious convictions held earlier in life. And this is what she found. Looking at over 150 examples, science barely featured at all, hardly ever mentioned. Conversions to unbelief were often associated with a change from conservative to more radical politics, with religion being rejected as part of established, privileged society. The reading of radical texts, such as Tom Paine's Age of Reason, was another prominent influence. Ironically, one of the other books most mentioned by those she studied was the Bible, <laughs> close study of which revealed what were seen as inconsistencies, absurdities, or particularly in the Old Testament, depictions of a vengeful and anthropomorphic deity. In 1912, you might be interested to know, in 1912, the president of the National Secular Society in Britain insisted that biblical stories of lust, adultery, incest, and unnatural vice were enough to raise blushes in a brothel. <laughs> the fact that every Christian sect, indeed every religion, claimed its own hotline to the truth was another consideration voiced many times and has nothing, obviously, or directly, to do with science. The perceived immorality of religious doctrines, particularly those concerning an afterlife, and the perceived immoral behaviour of some priests fueled a rejection of religious authority as of course it does today, and we don't really need to say more. 
The argument that atheists could be as morally upright as believers also took its toll. Historical, more than scientific research, was proving subversive as the biblical writers came to be seen not as timeless authorities, but as unreliable products of their own culture, which God may still have used, of course. Um, but it's an interesting shift. The distinguished anthropologist Mary Douglas once observed that those who imagine science the principal cause of secularization forget that religious activity is grounded in social relations, not primarily in concepts of nature. Consequently, I think it is wiser to look to long-term changes in social structure and to changes in religion itself if we wish to understand the momentum of secularity. In the mid-19th century, when the idea of conflict between science and religion first caught the public eye, the changes that most precipitated secular reaction came from within both Protestant and Catholic Christianity. On the Protestant side, claims for the inerrancy of scripture led to an unattractive bibliolatry. Similarly, claims for papal infallibility on matters of faith and doctrine and the strictures of the Syllabus of Errors, published by the Catholic Church in 1864, antagonized many. And among them was John William Draper, a chemist, whose history of the conflict between religion and science promulgated an overstated but extremely influential thesis that science and Catholic Christianity have been mortal enemies. Earlier, the intolerance shown by religious denominations to dissenters had provoked critical attitudes during the Enlightenment, especially in France, where Voltaire's quarrel with the Catholic Church was primarily on moral grounds. <coughs> As Voltaire realized, Newton's science this is the frontispiece to French translation of Newton's work. As Voltaire realized, Newton's science actually supported theism rather than atheism, and it continued to do so. Reasons then for a loss of faith or religious affiliation in individuals can be remarkably locally grounded. They can be remarkably diverse. Here's an example, which I've always found interesting, from John Ruskin, Victorian aesthete, writing on art and everything from geology uh, to the iniquity of Cambridge Railway Station. Um, Ruskin gives a very interesting account of his deconversion from evangelical Christianity. This is often ascribed to the fact that he worried so much about the geologists and their hammers chipping away at the biblical cadences. And indeed, he does say precisely that, uh, that it is very disturbing to faith uh, to have this constant chipping away. And yet, when he tells us what led to his ultimate renunciation of evangelical Christianity. It is art, not science, that is actually one of the key determinants. And his story goes like this. I'd just like to read a reminiscence from Fors Clavigero of April 1877. Ruskin. I was still in the bonds of my old evangelical faith. And in 1858, 
it was still with me, Protestantism or nothing. The crisis of the whole turn of my thoughts being one Sunday morning at Turin, when from before Veronese's Queen of Sheba, here's Ruskin, and here's Veronese's Queen of Sheba, and a quite overwhelmed sense of the artist's God-given power, I went away to a Waldensian chapel where a little squeaking idiot was preaching to an audience of 17 old women and three louts that they were the only children of God in Turin <laughs> and that all the people in the world out of sight of Monteviso would be damned. I came out of the chapel in some of 20 years of thought a conclusively unconverted man. And a component of that is the evangelical censorship of art for its sensuality, particularly art of that quality. I think I've been speaking long enough. I promised you, if you looked at my abstract, a little bit more on chemistry. And since we've moved from a Unitarian college to a Trinitarian <laughs> college, I was going to take us back to Joseph Priestley and to see how even a radical theologian like Priestley, a Unitarian, great chemist, of course, how even his chemistry was still regulated by a doctrine of providence. If you want to find out why Priestley became a Unitarian, you don't look at his chemistry. You look at his rejection of four Calvinist <laughs> doctrines, at least, for their immorality, in his view, like that all men should suffer for the misdemeanor of one man, Adam, which Priestley just found irrational and immoral. The doctrine of the fall he has to reject. And therefore, what follows from that, Christ's atonement for human sin. So we get a more radical Christology creeping in and then the doctrine of double predestination, as it was often presented. Not necessarily, of course, Calvin's own position. Priestley's reacting against what he has learnt about Calvin's theology. That's where you find the origins of a radical theological outlook. Priestley's chemistry, particularly, incidentally, one research programme um, where he reasoned along these lines, that if there is a providential God, that God must have arranged the world, if that world is also to be viable, in such a way that natural processes which are potentially destructive can in some way be restored or replenished. At the end of the 18th century, the most interesting and obvious example of a potentially destructive force in the world was our own breathing because we're fouling up the air all the time. God, therefore, must have supplied a mechanism somewhere in the system. The system is a key word. Somewhere in the system, there must be a mechanism for replenishing the air, rendering it more salubrious, says <laughs> Priestley. And where does he find it after what he admits has been a sustained program regulated by this providence? He finds it in vegetation. And he's right. He was right. You don't in Priestley find a complete doctrine of photosynthesis, but you almost 
And when Priestley was presented with the Copley Medal of the Royal Society by Sir John Pringle, then president, Pringle says, and I just love this phrase, Dr. Priestley, he says, you have had the great distinction of showing that not a single vegetable grows in vain. <laughs> and I've sometimes thought what a nice epitaph that would be on one's tombstone. Um, it wouldn't quite fit mine. Uh, <laughs> But I think having at least got chemistry into the picture at the end and having possibly said too much, I'll stop there. But thanks so much for listening so patiently. Thank you, John, so much for that. And um, there's some time for questions. Um, so if anybody has, I will be passing the microphone around, uh, wait for it, it's not for us to hear, but for the recording. So let's start here, then we go backwards. Well, thank, thank you very much. Um, if we can stick with chemistry, well, oh, rather yeah. with Herman Kolb again. Yeah. Um, very interesting what you said about him, um, stating that we, we could never know the structure of a molecule because we could never know God. That in theological terms is what we would say is apathetic theology, mm -hmm. the sheer unknowability of God. Yeah. And coming to, I mean, in my own faith, orthodoxy, uh, a lot is made of this complete and utter unknowability of, unknowability of God. And God is, in fact, maybe can be attempted to be described by what he isn't. Mm -hmm. But to attempt to describe what he is, it's utterly, completely futile. Um, and one might, in some ways, I suppose, lay that say that that is the root of all the problems that have stemmed in the Western Hemisphere, if you like, with Catholicism, the later Protestantism, in that we have attempted to describe God in various ways. I wondered how you might think of that as the root of all of these problems, going back further, maybe. Well, I think historians are all in for many roots rather than one, no matter what one is talking about. But I do take the point. And actually... Um, I mean, one thing one is certainly tempted to say, however, is that there are often very close resemblances between that apophaticism in theology and an agnosticism, which we tend to interpret as secular. I mean, Huxley is the person who invents the word agnostic, as a matter of fact, and ag agnosticism. Um, so if one's tracing a history of apophatic theology, it can very easily eventuate in a very agnostic form of theology and Christology. So that would be one mm. thing I would want to say about that. Um, it all depends, doesn't it, on which attributes of God you are wishing to be either apophatic or agnostic about. Because I actually find the use of the word agnostic or agnosticism very lewd, very vague and very loose. The scholar who has looked at the origins of agnosticism best um, is a Canadian scholar called Bernie Lightman, teaches at York University in Toronto. He's written books on Victorian agnosticism. And a very striking point that he makes is that the earliest generation of agnostics were not agnostic about the existence of God. They may be agnostic about ascribing certain attributes to God, but the existence of God is not encompassed by their agnosticism. So this shows us just how slippery some of these issues are. There are many staging posts from a kind of rational scepticism right through to the kind of 6.9 agnosticism to mm. which Richard mm. Dawkins owns, um, where seven means absolute um, atheism. Mm. Uh, there are many staging posts along the way. But as you took me back to Hermann Kolbe there, um, 
I was suddenly reminded of one other thing. I've been stressing the ambivalence of science vis-a-vis -vis secularity. And what I was suggesting in Colby's case is that it's his theology um, which is actually contributing almost to a kind of positivist philosophy in which we can't get to things we can't actually see. So we can't directly get to the structure and arrangement of atoms. But that same philosophy, even more assiduously, was being argued by a French chemist at the time, a contemporary, Marcelin Berthelot. If you go to France, every city has a street, Rue Marcelin Berthelot. He was the archetypal positivist philosopher of science during the Third Republic in France. He's a chemist. And he wants to claim that what we learn from chemistry must be secular lessons. And he's able to invoke his chemistry to support the same position that Colbe <laughs> proposed on theistic grounds. Berthelot argues on secular grounds. And chemistry is invoked because chemistry has succeeded, or rather chemists have succeeded, in synthesizing organic materials artificially. They've not simply imitated nature, they have surpassed nature. And who has surpassed nature more than most? Berthelot, for having synthesized formic acid from carbon monoxide and steam. So the artificial synthesis of organic compounds, to which Colbe contributed with his acetic acid, is being used there to promote a secular philosophy. But my point is, you see, what determines what goes on in these controversies is the presupposition, the preconception, <coughs> that you bring to your science. It's what you bring to it that is so critical. And then for the historian, the question, as you probably glimpsed from what I was saying, the, the, the interesting question becomes, where does that which you bring come from? Where do you get it from? And that can have many, many sources that have nothing whatever to do with science. Thanks. <laughs> yes, my story is very interesting. Thank you. Hi, thanks again for that. Um, I was interested in the way in which you uh, kind of reconcile Darwin and religion. I'd be interested in uh, your insight into how uh, another sort of uh, contemporaneous uh, current in science, uh, thermodynamics is also uh, absorbed by or uh, co-produced with or accommodated by uh, the sort of Christian eschatology. Okay, very nice question because I think it illustrates the same general point that I was making. The implications of thermodynamics for an eventual heat death of the universe was deeply disconsoling to Victorian scientists. Darwin himself is deeply affected by that. He actually says, you know, we, we look ahead and all that we cherish in the way of human culture is destined one day to go. It's the sort of thing which worries John Polkinghorne, I've noticed in his theological writings. Um, so thermodynamics, mid 19th century, there are discomforting conclusions. But if you adopt an interpretation of the second law of thermodynamics that entropy is always increasing, if it's always increasing and you extrapolate backwards, you conceivably get to a time when entropy equals zero because it can't keep on increasing and it couldn't have kept on increasing in the past if it didn't eventually 
go back to a point where it was very low. And so there were Christian apologists, some of them scientists, in the late 19th century who turned thermodynamics into an argument for Christian theism. They usually did so with some subtlety and sensibility. They didn't try to claim too much. They argue, if you like, for compatibility rather than for proof. But it's an interesting question. How do you account for incessant increase in entropy if the world does not have a finite age? But looking to the future, yes, it's bad news. But it's rather a long way. <laughs> it's rather a long way away. Um, and I think it has remained so in scientific speculation. Nice question. But you see the same point. The, the, the science is interpreted in different ways according to what your agenda is. And I don't want to be too crude about that. I mean, I'm not saying science is political and nothing else. That, that's a non-starter. But science gets used in these political ramifications. Thank you for your talk. There is um, one, th one question I wanted to ask is about, um, do you think that some people will have turned to science because they couldn't find the kind of hope in religion? For instance, you spoke about the tragedy in Darwin and the, tr the little girl who died 10 years old. And then if it is so, um, why is it that science anyway didn't solve his problem? And science, till now, in our 21st century, wouldn't solve any problem. Is it not like a kind of subjectivity to think that, to take our little story and put it in a big but public sphere and think it is the way that people should believe? And, and is it also what may have created secularism? It's, it's a very interesting question. I'm just trying to reflect further on what you said initially. You know, I think if I were willing to generalize at all, it would be that those who practice science do find all kinds of excitement, consolation, sometimes frustration in what they're doing. And that can meet certain existential needs. And in some cases, it may be that what they find in science, uh, they could not find in religion. That, I think, is an interesting proposition. However, if we're looking at people who are, as it were, outside the inner circle of professional science, for many, in times past, and in some constituencies still now, it is religious teaching and the affiliation with other people in a particular religious community that seems to confer a meaning and a direction on their life, which it is very difficult for science to do, particularly if you are not a practitioner. It's a bit like when physical scientists say, oh, you know, we see all this beauty in the universe. And you ask, well, where is it? Are you talking about a sunset or you know, a wonderful alpine vista that would have impressed Ruskin? Um, no, it's very often a mathematical equation. And when you're shown it, you look at this thing and you say, is that actually beautiful? Uh, it doesn't look like a work of art, that's for sure. Um, so there are, there are very deep questions about how people find some kind of meaning and identity in their lives. But I do think it's very optimistic on the part of secular scientists to imagine 
that what they see as the only source of the only ultimate source of cultural satisfaction should be acceptable to a wide conspectus of opinion in society. And after all, you, where do we find opposition to Darwin's theory, of course, still today? For the most part, it's outside the community of scientific expertise. And just to, f to finish the point is I want to emphasize also that I'm a Christian and uh, I do think that um, people who, the true science for me first is someone who understand that like you spoke about the transcendence that God have created, God, God is in divorce with science and also this, um, mis mis there is a kind of misunderstanding about true true faith or true religion and I think presumably what might have happened in the 90th or 70th century is people misunderstood God and that the message of the Bible like for instance you spoke about um, um, the suffering of animal and I think St. Paul is speaking quite cl clearly about this groaning of, of the whole universe until then there is a first, since the first decades there have been a kind of influence on human being behavior and, and animals and if people for instance are not connected with the truth of the Bible they would not understand this and I think also it also is a kind of coming back to uh, be embraced by, by the truth of, of the message of the Bible and if people become Christian they will be, be able to understand the, the meaning of their life and understand suffering, not rejecting suffering as and then using science as an alternative. And the other thing I wanted to say about the church also, you spoke about the church, um, that people who think that priests um, will, will reject the, the Catholic uh, the church, the Catholic church for instance, because of um, misconduct of priests. Uh, the church is still holy in the sacrament, then the priests are just instruments of God and they are also um, sinners like us, but also they are also uh, instruments of God, that they have a divine office and they bring us hope also and the Eucharist. Okay, could I just sacraments. interject for a moment? Because so. I think what what is particularly interesting in what you've said is where you have gone back to the Bible and claimed that if only one were familiar with the Bible as a Christian, one would not have problems here. But the issues for many are actually more complicated than that because the, the issue is how you interpret passages in scripture. You may be referring to Paul in Romans where he's talking about the whole creation groaning in travail. And that verse has been used as a very important peg on which to hang Christian Theodicies. There's a very interesting book, I mean, if you want to just to follow this up, by Christopher Southgate called The Groaning of Creation, where he's quite explicitly invoking that Pauline um, perspective and talking very much about animal suffering. The point I was making, however, is that theologians who have, as it were, taken seriously that issue of animal suffering have been very much in the minority, it seems to me, that theodicies are constructed around human, very anthropocentric kind of concepts. That was really the point I was making. As sorry, as as if you want to finish, just one very last thing is about sorry, speaking about Mother Teresa and St. Francis. Sorry, we can, you can look at the church like that too. Okay, what I wanted to say. You can look at the good thing in the church. Thank you. The beginning of that question seemed to work from the basis that we were talking about scientists who find their existential needs satisfied in the practice of science, and perhaps religious people who don't find their existential needs <laughs> satisfied there, but in their religion. So I'd like to just propose the possibility that there is a third group of people who don't actually practice science on a very deep level, but want to affiliate with it or associate with it. And in the process, perhaps they turn their science into a kind of a religion without a god. 
And maybe a fourth group that corresponds to them of people who do not plunge into their religion and find that it satisfies them, but who want to be associated with it as religious people and in the process turn it into a science. And I would see in that perhaps that third group being a kind of science as religion, the people who become what C.S. Lewis referred to as militant agnostics. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you don't know, and nobody can know. And on the other hand, those people who, for the sake of their religious aspirations, are willing to take what they think of is science and prove the, the adage that a little knowledge is a dangerous thing mm -hmm. by saying crazy things, you know, dinosaurs, footprints with humans, and some of these other things that we have heard argued. I'd like to hear your reaction. To well, that. let me just say that I think you're absolutely right, and the two positions you've identified there are two more categories in which we could certainly place a good number of historical figures. For example, we were talking a moment ago, or I was rather, um, about Maslan Bertolo, a, a chemist who accepts a positivist philosophy. That positivist philosophy was first articulated in France by Auguste Comte, who has this wonderful vision of three stages for the history of humankind. The religious phase, when everything was explained by gods. Then a more metaphysical phase, when we got rid of the gods, but actually we still needed one god at least um, to kind of undergird the whole system. And we looked to more metaphysical concepts like forces and principles and things to explain the world. And then now, in 19th century France, We've got science, triumphant, positivist science, where all that matters now are facts and laws. So science does, in the way you describe it, almost become the new religion. Because Kant, believe it or not, gives rise to churches, to hymns, to festivals. At Christmas, you have your Christmas tree still. It's a kind of pagan symbol, but you've still got Christmas tree. You've got carols still. You've got churches. There's a real sense in which Kantian positivism becomes a surrogate religion. In fact, it was sometimes described as Catholicism without God. So that would be a really nice example of your first category, I think, where science does become a a religion. There were celebrations within that Kantian church, and what they celebrated were the wonderful achievements of French science. You know, it's, it's just all integrated in, in that way. So science can become a kind of surrogate religion in that way. I don't doubt it for a moment. Um, the other category you mentioned, where one gets perhaps not a great um, deal of immersion in religion or theology, but just wanting to affiliate and to some degree. I was thinking of Martin Rees when you, when you made that point. I mean, a very distinguished former president of the Royal Society who goes to church regularly. Now, he says that he doesn't believe um, much, perhaps if any, um, what he's asked to believe in those services. But it's, an, it's a cultural affiliation um, and something which he greatly values because it places one in a tradition. I completely forgotten about that. Maybe we need a fifth category. I was actually thinking of some of the problems with uh, what used to be called creationism and it's very extreme version of a 7,000 year old earth. You know, oh, uh, yes. You know, that, kind of, that, that was really mm. good. Well, of course, those who subscribe to those views often claim that their position is the best scientific account. I mean, it, the whole thing gets very complicated because of the way language gets used in those debates. Anyway, I was just wondering what you were talking about. No, it's a very good question, I think. Hi, um, 
Uh, thank you for that talk, and thanks for the inclusion of chemistry. I'm doing a detail on that at the moment. Um, oh, good for you. And <laughs> I'm, uh, uh, I take as mu many uh, opportunities as I can to talk about this sort of stuff with uh, my peers in, in the lab. And I'm trying to work out as well for myself, as far as I can, what causes uh, a rejection of belief. Um, and I, I just wanted to share an idea and see what you think. Um, you did allude to it a little bit, which is the god of the gaps. <laughs> and, uh, and all of my ideas come under a um, misunderstanding of what God is. Uh, so a lot of it seems to be uh, the reason for God is to explain what we can't. And on that premise, yeah. most people would reject it. Yes, exactly so. I was, I was just going to say, as you were speaking, one of the great Oxford chemists <coughs> of the 20th century was Charles Coulson, okay. who was also a Methodist lay preacher. And Charles Coulson wrote a book called Science and Christian Belief. It came out, I think, in the early 1950s. And many people of my generation Here's a confession coming up. <laughs> um, many people of my generation will say that reading that book was a very powerful influence. It was certainly one of the things that got me into interesting conversations on science and religion. Because Coulson in that book warns about the dangers of constructing these debates around a god of the gap. Now, I don't think he was the first to use that phrase, God of the Gaps, but he gave more publicity to it, probably, than anybody else up to that time. And he explains why it is a misrepresentation mm. of a classical Christian understanding of God's relationship to the world. Because mm. he was, I mean, his line was, if you look at any object in this world, now, whether you're talking about an animal or even just a man-made house, you can look at that object from many different points of view, many perspectives. If it's a three-dimensional object, you know, you can have a plan of one side of it, um, or you can have a plan from above. You, you need many complementary perspectives to get to the truth. And he contrasted that position with the naivety of a god of the gaps, where you're bringing God in simply to explain what science can't explain. So his book is a warning to Christians not to fall into that trap, mm. but it's also a way of explaining to the skeptical scientific community that they're trying to bury the wrong god. Exactly, yeah. And that's your point, isn't it? Did, and you're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. There's another tiny bit, or? There's two more questions, so just four more minutes. Okay, so I'll, Mar yeah, yeah, that's fine. Margaret, um, I know I'd ask both the participants asking questions and the speaker, please, to be brief oh. in questions and answers. Yes, please. right. I will try to be very brief. <laughs> um, thank you very much, um, Professor, for the, a very enlightening uh, presentation tonight. I think with the, some of the responses we've had from the floor in um, defence of uh, not only the sciences but in fact for religion, um, your paper has helped us and perhaps pointed to something that is more positive that might come from such examinations in saying that there's complexities and they are indeed very complex in both religion study and in the sciences. Um, you've also raised a very important issue about presuppositions and sources and where such thinking comes from and the interpretations that are then imposed very, fairly quickly and come out in doctrines. And my question now is to say, given the presentation you have and what you're pointing us to, is it not suggesting that the theologians or those studying religion, as well as those in the sciences, have in fact profounder things to um, explore in their own disciplines within the right 
methodology for those dis disciplines, and then to come to a higher point of open dialogue, as I think we had with even Richard Dawkins and the Archbishop and, um, and Sir Anthony Kenny feeding them, uh, to talk together at that higher level that we may move to a much more profound understanding of the reality we're seeking to come to terms with. I'm asked to give a succinct reply, <laughs> which is yes. <laughs> No, you're absolutely right, Margaret. And if I've contributed to that, I'm very happy. It is true I am sometimes <laughs> given the credit for something called the complexity thesis. And then I'm accused of modestly denying this. <laughs> but, but my denial of it has nothing to do with modesty. It is that I do not believe it's a thesis. I believe it's a fact. I have to be also succinct. I'll try my best. Uh, we haven't spoken enough about the people who become uh, believers because, because of science. Some people do science so seriously then they end up becoming believers. I have names, so I can give names. It's not a case number. We can discuss more, but that no, is the case. You are right. And yes. the most of, not most of them, some of them use the Holy Fathers, the patristics, to justify, not to justify, but to help them on that way. And we Certainly. know or, uh, there is a lot in Gregory of Nyssa and St. Basil in Origen also to help on that way. Yes, I entirely agree. And we've opened up yet another category, which just shows how rich and interesting our investigation has to be. I agree. I was privileged to take over the directorship of the Ian Ramsey Centre when I came to Oxford in 1999 from Arthur Peacock, who is well known to some of you here. And Arthur would be a very good example of somebody who has certainly claimed that it was through his biochemical research, some of which actually fed in to that famous work on DNA that came out in 1953 with Crick and Watson. Arthur certainly would be a good example of a practicing biochemist who, having once been an atheist, I mean, quite an avowed skeptic and an atheist, was brought into religious faith through the realization that there is, in the last analysis, something amazing about this world. <laughs> Yes, well, of course, that's yet another wonderful question. Why is it that God talk is more prevalent among physicists than, shall we say, among evolutionary biologists, than among chemists, for the most part? Um, why is it? What is distinctive about the methodologies of particular sciences? I was meant to be brief. I read it. <laughs> well, thank you very, very much, John, again, for a wonderful evening. Um, before we thank him all together, I'd like to invite you in two weeks' time to the same place. Professor Neil uh, Messer will be lecturing on theology and neurosciences. So you're all invited to that. Uh, now please join me in thanking John again. Thank you.